Hello, and welcome to a basic guide on I squared C. In this video, I'll go over some basics about how it works, why you would want to use it, and most importantly, how it works with your Pico. I will be using a BNO005 accelerometer from Bosch as a sort of worked example to show you how it works, but this guide will be applicable for pretty much any I squared C device that you want to use. You will just have to change what you send to the device but I'll show you how to work this out. Feel free to skip some of the basic sections using the timestamps below if you already know a thing or two about I squared C. As always, the source code written in this video is available from my website, and a written article version is also available. Both will be linked in the description. So, let's start with a little background to I squared C. I squared C is a two wire communication protocol with each of these two wires supporting multiple peripheral devices. These wires are SDA and SCL. SDA is the data line and SCL is the clock line. I squared C is simply a communication interface. You will still need to power these peripheral devices using wires extra to these two here. You can chain multiple devices together along the SDA and SCL lines, like so. There is a theoretical limit of 128 devices on the bus, but practically achieving that limit can be challenging. For most hobbyist projects, you are unlikely to get anywhere close to that limit. In order for communication to work correctly, there must be pull-up resistors on this bus. Now I won't get into too much detail about how these work, but the RP2040 chip has some weak ones built in. The RP2040 datasheet suggests that we use external pull-up resistors. However, luckily for us, many breakout boards, like so, have them already included. You can check by looking at the breakout board schematic and if you find pull-up resistors then you don't need external ones. If you find out that you do need to use external pull-up resistors, you can check out the guide by SparkFun linked in the description which explains it all a lot better than I can. To connect your I2C devices to the Pico, you can use any of the GPIO pit ports labelled I2C in the pinout diagram. Both the SDA and SCL lines must be connected to the same I squared C controller. In the case of the Pico, that's controller one or zero. So I'm going to wire up my Pico to the breakout board now. I'm going to use GPIO pins four and five on the Pico, which are the physical pin six and seven. These pins correspond to the I squared C zero port. I will also power the breakouts using the 3.3 volts output pin, which is physical pin 36, and its nearest ground, which is pin 33. Okay, so now you have an idea about how the devices are physically connected. Let's check out the principle of operation of the I2C protocol. The clock line, or SCL line, allows the data on the data line to be sampled correctly. When data is to be sent, the sending device brings the clock line low and then transmits data along the SDA line. Then the receiving device will sample the data line each time the clock edge is triggered. If there was no clock line present, the communicating devices would have no clue at what rate to sample the data line and the whole communication process would break down. Thankfully, the I2C controllers handle this clock signal, so we only have to define the communication rate and the controllers do the rest. When we want to send data to a peripheral, we send a series of frames. Each frame contains a series of bits. In the message that we send, the first frame is a 7-bit address of the peripheral, followed by a read, 1, or write, 0 request. This informs the peripherals on the I2C bus which device this message is intended for, and the read-write bit tells the peripheral whether the controller is sending data or requesting data from it. After the address frame, a series of 8-bit data frames are sent. The most significant bit, or MSB, is sent first in a data frame. This means that the binary bit which corresponds to the highest value is sent first. After all the data frames have been sent, a stop frame ends the message and frees up the I2C bus. OK, hopefully that gave you an idea of the actual operation of I2C. Let's briefly cover how you actually implement this. Most microcontrollers have pre-built libraries or drivers, such as the Pico SDK for the Raspberry Pi Pico. 
This SDK contains functions which handle most of the low-level hardware interactions so we don't have to. We will be using these in this project to set up and initialize the I2C port for the read and write operations. There are three basic functions that we will need to use during this example. For most projects, these are probably the only functions that you will need. Firstly, we initialize the I2C communication using the I2C init function. Then we write data to the peripheral device with the I2C write blocking function. And obviously we are going to want to read data from the device and we do this using the I2C read blocking function. The blocking part simply means that the whole program waits for this communication to occur, a bit like the printf statement if you've used that before. There are many other functions which are suitable for different applications and you can find them along with explanations on page 115 of the Pico SDK documentation. For a write request to the peripheral, so if we want to write data to it, we simply use the write function. However, for a read operation, so we are requesting data, we first send the address of the specific register that we want to read. Then we use the read function to receive this data from that register. This might initially sound a little convoluted, but you'll be able to see this quite clearly once we start the examples. Let's get into an example so I can tell you and show you how these functions work. We're gonna make sure when we create our project that we include the hardware I squared C libraries in our CMake lists file, as well as the Pico standard libraries. You can find out more about setting up your project in the video in the cards above. In the C file, we include the STDIO, Pico standard libraries, and the hardware I2C libraries. We are going to use two functions in this program, our main function, and we are also going to create an initialization function for our device, in this case, the accelerometer. Our first order of business is to use the STDIO init all function in our main file, our main function. This will allow us to print to serial over the USB interface. If you want to know more about this, there is a video in the cards above where I go through printing over USB serial. Now, let's get into initializing the I2C communication. Firstly, I'm going to define a constant value called I2C port. This definition takes the value I2C0, which is the port that we wired our peripheral device to. Then I'm going to create a global variable of the address of the peripheral. When looking at the BNO005 datasheet, the address of the device is 0x28. You can find the address of pretty much any device that you use in its respective datasheet. Now, in our main function, we're going to initialize the I2C using the I2C init function, whose arguments is the I2C port we defined earlier and the speed of the communication in Hertz. I'm going to use 400 kilohertz. Bear in mind that the I2C communication protocol on the Pico operates at a maximum speed of one megahertz, but other controller devices can operate up to five megahertz. For most applications, one megahertz communication is plenty fast enough. Now we need to configure the GPIO pins that the SCL and SDA lines are connected to. We need to set them to their alternate function I2C communication and then enable their internal pull-up resistors. We use the GPIO set function with the arguments of the pin number and then the GPIO function I2C. Then to enable the GPIO pull-ups, we simply use the GPIO pull-up function with the pin number as the argument. It is important to note that these pin numbers are the GPIO pins, not the physical pin numbers on the board. See the Pico pinout for reference. Then we are going to call our initialization function that we just created. In this initialization function, the first thing that we are going to do is check to see if the peripheral device is connected properly. Pretty much every I2C device has a chip ID, usually, usually stored in the register with address zero. You'll be able to find this in the device data sheet, uh, usually in the register map. As this is a known value, we can read this from the register and compare it to its expected value. If they match, then our chip is connected properly. If they don't, then we know we have a problem. As you can see from the BNO005 datasheet, we expect this chip to have the ID 
or the hex value of A0. This will be a perfect example of a read operation where we have to use both the write and read function in order to get the data that we want from the chip. Firstly, before I start, I will add a short delay to give uh, the BNO005 some time to start up and sort of configure itself how it wants to. We create a variable called register, or reg in this case, which takes the value of the register that we want to read from. We then create another variable in the form of an array to hold the data we receive. Then we use the i squared c write blocking function with the arguments of the i squared c port, the peripheral device address, the address of the variable we stored the register variable in, the size of the data transfer, one byte in this case, and finally true, as shown on the screen. The boolean true argument means that the controller retains control of the i squared c bus. It does this by not sending the stop signal at the end of the message. And this um, sort of functionality is useful when we are performing a read operation as we are using the write function, then immediately the read function. The read function that we use has many of the same arguments. However, we use the array we created to store the received data. And the amount of data we expect to receive, again in this case, is one byte. And we can set the Boolean argument to false to tell the controller to release control of the I squared C bus. I will then create a very simple if statement to compare our received value to the one that we expected. If the address is what we expected, then we can say the chip is connected correctly and the I squared C communication is functioning properly. You could test the connection now at this point by building and running the program. However, I already know that my device is connected properly, so I'll skip this step. The rest of our initialization function can be used to send configuration commands to the device. For example, I will use the write function to tell the BNO005 chip that I want it to use its internal oscillator. If we look in the datasheet, we can see that by setting the register system trigger, which has the address of 3F, to a binary value of 0010000000, four zeros I think, it will use its internal oscillator and trigger a reset. It is important to note that some compilers can only handle a hex format. So I will use this. It is very straightforward to convert from binary to hex and vice versa using the Windows Calculator app in programmer mode. If you want to learn more about sort of bitwise operations, binary and hex, let me know in the comments and I might create a video about it. So for a simple write operation, I will create an array of two unsigned 8-bit integers. The first value takes the register address that we want to send, and the second value is the data that we want to transmit. Then we simply use the i squared c write blocking function to send the array to the peripheral. Note that we have changed the data size to 2 as we are sending the register address and its new value at once. As we are using uh, sorry, as we aren't using other peripheral I2C devices, it doesn't really matter if we give up control of the bus, so we can use the false boolean value at the end of the function. When you're using your own device, perhaps not the BNO005, whatever I2C device you're using, you can use this process to write data to the registers that you need to. You will obviously have different values, but you can find all of these in the respective data sheets of your peripheral. There is a lot more configuration code that I need to do to make this accelerate, accelerometer function correctly. But as I will use the same process that I just explained, I will copy and paste it in as there is no point repeating myself. You can find the source code linked in the description. Back in our main function, I am simply going to create an infinite while loop which constantly reads the X, Y, and Z acceleration registers and prints them over the USB serial interface. Before the loop, I will declare some variables to store the x, y, and z acceleration values, both the received 8-bit values and combined floats. Here, we use exactly the same read then write sequence that gave us the chip ID, except with different registers. As each value of the acceleration is stored across two registers, and there are three axes, we need to read a total of six registers. This would be a really clunky process if we had to do a a write then read sequence for each register. Thankfully for us, the I squared C registers automatically increment. This means that we can change the expected received data amount to six bytes and we'll read the six registers 
from the ad register address that we send. So in our example, we want to read the acceleration registers starting at the hex address of 08 and ending at 0D. We do this simply by sending the start address with the I squared C write blocking function and then following it up with the read function with six expected bytes. With that done, the six register values are stored in our data array. A little bit of logic is required to combine two registers into one acceleration value. We simply shift the most significant bits, the most significant eight bits, up eight places and using the OR function with the lower eight bits. I will divide the acceleration values by 100 to get the correct order of magnitude output. I will use the printf function to print the data to the serial monitor and also add a short delay of 100 milliseconds using the sleep ms function. Now that's the coding finished. We can now build this project and upload it to the Pico. Open your serial monitor of choice and point it to the COM port, which your Pico will be interfacing with. The board rate will be 115,200. You should now see the acceleration output change as you move the breadboard around. Now, obviously, if you haven't used this accelerometer, then the changes of whichever parameter you're measuring, say temperature, pressure, will change on the serial monitor as you adjust them. So hopefully this video has helped you learn the basics of I2C and how to use it on your Pico. If this video has helped you, then please consider leaving a like and subscribing, and feel free to leave any feedback or requests in the comments below.